Good morning, everyone, once again. Happy Sabbath to you. Happy Sabbath. You know, it does not cease to amaze me. You know what doesn't cease to amaze me? That every time, especially like every time I come up to preach, especially in Revelation, I get attacked. Our church gets attacked. Some, um, some uh, weeks ago when I was scheduled to preach on uh, Revelation 10, got into a car accident. On most mornings when I come to preach on Revelation, my heart gets stirred to frustration about the things of my life. In this past week, we had at least three near car accidents on the way here. And today as we focus on like another chapter in Revelation, the AC just goes out beyond its regular, goes above and beyond the call of to go out. So we see nothing short of an attack. There is a reason why this message is not being allowed to be preached right now, why we're trying, we're trying to be stopped. I was getting attacked in like a, my feelings just this morning. And here we are here. When you have the heat, people's tempers flare in the heat. So it's nothing short of a spiritual attack that is designed to keep us from this word from getting preached in the way that it should be. So I encourage you all to take the lessons that you learn from this and note carefully how the enemy works to hinder this message from being shared. It's a good message. And today we are going to focus on Revelation 18. We talked about Revelation 17 last week. We ID'd who Babylon is last week. But now we're going to focus on the judgment decreed to Babylon this week. So today's um, chapter is Revelation 18, the judgment of Babylon. Revelation 18, the judgment of Babylon. So as we begin, let us pray and we'll begin, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us once again to your house. For once again, learning about Babylon. Once again, Lord, learning about the things that are needful for our generation. We pray, O oh God, that by your grace, that you will help your servant to speak the truth, that you will be glorified, that your will will be done. And I pray to those who are out there hearing the message right now, that they will receive that which is needful, that you will be glorified there. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to unbutton real quick because I already know, this is, I know where this is about to go, so I have to be very mindful. This is something I, I find very exciting. So let us begin with Revelation 18. We're going to look at verse 1. As we read this, just keep in mind these notes. Take notes, take, make a note of the references because what's going to happen is we're going to keep giving you references throughout the We won't have time to go through them all today, but I'm going to give you enough references so you can go back and check the facts. Check it for yourself. Don't just look at this because you hear me saying it. Look at it because God has evidence that these things are true, and we need to understand them before it is too late. Revelation 18, verse 1 reads, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. The angel symbolizes the character of a message that will be shared worldwide. And that message will go forth with great power. It came from heaven. This angel came from heaven, which tells us who sent it, and it tells us where it came from. When the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 were given, they were given by men and women, moved by the Holy Spirit, to take it worldwide. Those who give this message will be filled with the Spirit to give the final warning. This is the work of the 144,000. Revelation 18, verses 2 and 3 and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations are drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. This message will be preached with such power that everyone on the face of the earth will hear it. It ties into each of the three angels' messages. Did you know that? The first angel's message 
warned the world that the hour of judgment had come. That message began to be preached on August 11, 1840, shortly before the investigative judgment began on October 22, 1844. At the time of the message of Revelation 18 is preached, that, that judgment will be almost over, will almost be over. When everyone has chosen whom they will serve, God or Satan, the investigative judgment will shift from the dead in Christ to the professing saints of the time. This time, the righteous will have been judged to be righteous before Jesus returns, which is why they will receive the reward of the righteous when he returns. Look at that for yourself in Revelation 22, verse 12. That's why the righteous dead and living will meet the Lord in the air. You can see that for yourself. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 tell us this. The second angel's message of Babylon's fall was broadcast in the 1840s. By the time of this message given by the 144,000, it will have been completely formed and fallen. The dragon symbolizes a symbol of spiritualism and pagan faiths. The beast, symbol of papal Rome, and the false prophet, the United States and apostate Protestantism, the three parts which make up Babylon, which you can see for yourself, Revelation 12, 13 verses 1 through 10, 11 through 18, and 16 verses 13 through 19, will have united and convinced the world to form the image of the beast. You can see that for yourself, Revelation 13 verses 11 through 14. It is during this time, the time of this message, the world will decide whether or not to take the mark of Babylon's authority, the mark of the beast. The third angel's message will be preached with all power here at this time. At this time, all the nations will have been taught the doctrines of Babylon, the wine of the wrath of its fornication, its mingling. That's, that means it's, fornic it's mingling of pure Christian teachings with pagan doctrines. All the world's governments will be allied with it. All the great men, the merchants of the earth, Revelation 18.25, will have been enriched by it. Apostasy will be at its height. When Babylon reaches its point, it shifts from being Babylon to Babylon the Great. You can look at Revelation 14, verse 8. Look at Revelation 17, verse 5. You see, at first it's called Babylon has fallen, and then you see in Revelation 17, Babylon the Great. So you see a shift here. At this point, the fallen church has officially reached a point of no return in the eyes of heaven. Now, what other signs are there to indicate that the church will have fallen to this point? There are other signs. Revelation 18 verse 2 says that Babylon the Great will become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. There are five references to the word devils as used in Revelation 18 verse 2. Three of them refer to the case of Legion, the man possessed with enough devils to fill 2,000 pigs. You can see it for yourself in Matthew 8 31, Mark 5 verse 12, and Luke 8 verse 29. People will be demon possessed in this church state system and it'll be widespread. They will have made the souls of the wicked their home, and no one will be able to cast them out. Babylon will be the hold, the prison of every foul spirit. Why is it a prison? Because it was Jesus and his followers that cast out evil spirits. They set people free. Look at this for yourself. Mark 9, verses 17 through 27. Luke 10, 17 through 20. And Acts 16, verses 16 through 18. Apart from the Lord, no one can cast them out. As a result, Babylon will be a prison house, a world of men possessed by demons. In addition, Revelation 18, verse 2 says that Babylon will become a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, a prison of the impure and detestable. That's what it means in the Greek for, you know, unclean and hateful, impure and detestable. The word bird in the text means birdling, a baby bird. The birdlings are a symbol of the young. Like the children of Noah's time, Genesis 6, verse 5, the children of our generation will be corrupted. Every imagination of the thoughts of their hearts will be evil continually. The well of humanity will have been utterly, permanently tainted. Those whose hearts have been blackened by the impure, detestable things of the world who knowingly choose to take of the mark of the beast, cannot be saved. This is not because God does not want to save them. It is because parents fail to train their children 
up in the way they should go. Proverbs 22, verse 6. The children who knew no better, babies and etc., will be delivered because they had no knowledge of the law. Look at this for yourself. Romans 3, verse 20. Romans 2, 14, 15. And in verse 3, we already kind of talked a little further on in verse 3. It talks about the, the merchants of the earth. Babylon forced all nations to partake of her pagan Christian doctrines. Babylon had illicit relations with global leaders, relations she used to lead them to war against God. Babylon enriched the great men, the merchants of the earth. These merchants, persons of high rank or eminence, gained the, their whole world and lost their souls. They sold the luxuries of Babylon, the things that would separate people from God. Look at 1 John verses 2, verse, 2, verse 15 to 16. We're not going there right now, but look at that for yourself. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16, it tells you this. Babylon led the world to it and not to the God it professes to serve. This is why it's fallen. Verse 4, Revelation 18, verse 4 reads, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and they receive not of her plagues. It is at this moment, right before the seven last plagues, at the height of Babylon's rebellion, God's people are going to hear him call them, I call them out of Babylon. God has a faithful people in the pagan face of the world, in the Roman Catholic Church, and in the Catholic system, excuse me, and the apostate Protestant Church. They will have heard the warning of the 144,000 and seen the fallen church for what it is a corrupted system Satan used to deceive the whole world, Revelation 12, verse 9. With the issues made plain, the call from God made to them directly. They had the issues plain, the call was made to them directly. These faithful souls will come out of Babylon. If they, stand, if they stayed any longer, if they still stay any longer, they would have become a part of Babylon. The protection of God would have been withdrawn from them. Did everyone hear what I just said? When he says, come out of Babylon, come out now. If you hear the call, do not stay in Babylon. I can witness my family. I can say my family. It's too late for that. Come out of Babylon. Come out of my people. You're not partakers of her sins. If you choose to stay after God tells you to come out, you will partake of the sins of Babylon as you've done them all yourself. When he says, come out, Come out then. Be obedient servants. Be faithful Bereans. Do not question. Trust and leave. Revelation 18, verse 5. It says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Her sins have reached unto heaven. This is exactly what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah before Sodom and the cities of the plain were destroyed? Everyone go to Genesis 18, verses 20 and 21. Everyone go there. Genesis 18, 20 through 21. Let me know when you're all there. We all there? Thank you. Genesis 18, verses 20 and 21 reads, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. You know what? I'm going to turn also. It's not in the, um, the, the scriptures, but I'm going to go ahead and put it on there. Really, like a Genesis 19, verses 12 and 13. I'm going to add that on there. The angels that come to Babylon, the angels that come to Babylon, like come to see me, come to Sodom, and you're going to see exactly what they said. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son in law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in this city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because a cry of them is waxing great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The literal Babylon was destroyed, literal Babylon was destroyed because their sins reached unto heaven. Jeremiah 51 verse 9. 
The sins of Sodom and Gomorrah reached unto heaven, and it was destroyed. The Babylon, Revelation 18, it is going to suffer the seven last plagues because sins reached unto heaven. Let's go to, back to Revelation now. Revelation 18, verse 6. Revelation 18, verse 6. Let's go ahead and get there. Are we all back? Excellent. Revelation 18, verse 6 reads, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. God committed the judgment to Jesus. You can look at it for yourself, John 5, verse 22. And he's telling him to reward Babylon as Babylon rewarded him. But why is it going to suffer a twofold punishment? You know, filled her cup double. Babylon's work was such a character that it merited double punishment. It persecuted the saints and it exalted itself as God. 18, verse 7 of Revelation. Is how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Babylon's self-exaltation and luxurious living, like Nebuchadnezzar before it, caused it to think of itself higher than it actually was. The thoughts of the system are revealed in this next, the next part of this verse. Look at this carefully. It says, I sit a queen. When it, Babylon says, I sit a queen, it's saying, I rule over the kingdoms of the earth. Revelation 17, 18, we talked about that one last week. It says, I am no widow. It says, it's saying that my husband cannot perish. Isaiah 47, verses 7 through 8, and John 3, 29, back this up. A wife is married to a husband. Babylon believes that it is still the church of Christ, even after all it has become and done. And then it says, I shall see no sorrow. It is saying that I will not experience a sorrow caused by someone's death. Babylon assumes they will always be Christ's church, that the two will always be together. Overall, Babylon assumes that it will rule the world forever. This is its peace and safety message. But what does the Bible say happens after this message is given? 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 tells us that it will be sudden destruction that will come upon them and they shall not escape. Let's look at Revelation 18, verse 8. Revelation 18, verse 8 reads, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Put your finger on this page, and we're going to uh, turn to Daniel 4, verses 27 through 31. We're going to read that. Daniel 4, 7 through 21. When you have it, please say amen. I want to make sure we're all here. I hear one. Daniel 4, 7, 27 through 31. We all there? Okay. Daniel 4, 27 reads, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel, counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I had built for the house and kingdom and the, and the, of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. Twelve months after King Nebuchadnezzar was warned to turn from his sins, he asked his prideful question. Immediately, his judgment came. Within one year, the Babylon of Revelation 18 will suffer the seven last plagues. Each of them will bring death, mourning, and famine upon it. Like Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord gives us time to repent, time to break off our sins and iniquities. He gives us time. He sends his prophets throughout the world, pointing them to the coming judgment. He counsels the world through his prophecies that Jesus will set up his kingdom on the earth. Jesus is going to do it. 
themes that arrest the attention of faithful and unfaithful minds cause them to consider whether or not these things are so. But salvation lies not in mere contemplation of the truth. It is how we respond to the truth that determines whether or not we will be saved. The faithful will respond with repentance and be saved. The rebellious will respond with rebellion, wickedness, and be lost. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. God is going to utterly destroy this kingdom because it led the world to apostasy. Let's go back to Revelation 18. We're going to look at verse 9 now. And it reads, Revelation 18 verse 9 reads, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her, and they shall see the smoke of her burning. The destruction of Babylon will be so momentous that even the kings of the earth who did not respond to the gospel will bewail and lament over it. They will be moved with pity over the fall of Babylon, but their hearts will not change. Verse 10, Revelation 18. Standing afar off of the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. The king's lamentation of Babylon tells us two things. In the first part, they grieve the loss of that mighty city. They were among the many that wandered after the beast, Revelation 13, verse 3, and worshiped it, saying, who is able to make war with him? Revelation 13, verse 4. The kings of the earth revered Babylon's might. They put their faith in it as the men of Jericho put their faith in the city's walls to protect them from Joshua and the Israelites. In the second part of their lamentation, the kings of the earth declare that Babylon's fall was God's judgment. It was not a coincidence they will acknowledge that God judged it. Many of Babylon's inhabitants will have fled before this time. The kings, watch this, the kings, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, and every bondman and freeman will have fled to the mountains, standing afar for the fear of Babylon's torment, lamenting Babylon's fall. The people know that God's day of wrath has come. Now, if Babylon, that mighty city, fell, who would be able to stand? You can see that in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. The harmony is there. Revelation 18, verse 11 reads, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The great men of the earth, famous people, and people of high rank that fled with the kings to the mountains, will also lament Babylon's fall. Verse 11 describes these famous persons as merchants, but verse 23 describes them as the great men. The two descriptions are connected because the great men of the earth sold their merchandise to gain their fame and rank. Their reign and fame and depended on this, but with no one to buy their goods, they lost everything. Let's look at Revelation chapter 18, verses 12 and 13. And it reads, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of, of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. 28 items. 28 items were on this list. 19 out of 28 of those items were used to build and carry out the services of the temple of the Lord. 19 out of 28. Look at the list. These items listed here are telling us that the great men of the earth sold things that mingled the truth with falsehood. 
And you can see it's only a minor portion, 9 out of 28. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. All you need is a little falsehood. By the wares they sold, the great men acknowledged that God exists. Babylon relied on the wares of the world to rule the church. That's why the church became similar to it. Everyone give me just a moment, okay? I want to make sure we got something correct here. Yes. Okay, so in verses 2 and 3, I mentioned that um, the merchant of the earth was in Revelation 18.25. That's actually in 18.23. I want to make sure we do correct that. So that's my point on verses eight, uh, Revelation 18, verses 2 and 3. So that's actually verse 18, verse 23. Make sure to correct myself. Praise. Thank you, Lord. All right. Let's go back and let's take a look at Revelation 18, verse 14. And it says, And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. When you look at the definition of the word fruits, it refers to ripe fruits and to late summer slash early autumn, the time when the fruits are ripe. The fruits Babylon wanted to eat were forbidden, but they lusted after them. The Greek word for lusted here refers to a longing, especially for what is forbidden. Babylon longed to partake of something it was forbidden to have. They labored for world domination, total submission by the world to it, and they ate of the fruits of their labors. The mark of the beast secured a submission of most of the world's population. It will. But with the second coming of Jesus, Babylon's hold on the world is now gone. But that's not all Babylon lost. All the merchandise that Babylon bought from the merchants of the earth and the people of the sea that was dainty and goodly will be gone. Babylon won't be able to find them again because they will no longer exist. Babylon will no longer exist. Now, we were counseled by Jesus to lay up our treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 20. But many will have laid up their treasure in the hands of the great men of the earth because they were famous or they had a high rank in society. Even the church has fallen prey to their influence. Their merchants were made rich by Babylon. Instead of leading the great men of the earth to lay up their treasure in heaven, fallen Christians will have been led to lay up their treasure in the earth. We talked about that in Sabbath school today. It is this failure in investing that will cause many to lose eternity. What you invest your time in, your talents, your money, etc., what you invest in the most is a testament to what you value the most. Matthew 6, 21, for your treasure, though your heart will be also. The thing every Christian should value, every Christian should value, is eternal life. It should be their aim to be where Jesus is. When Jesus returns, he will take his people to where he has prepared a place for them. John 14, verse 3. Those who have made heaven their goal will be there. Those who make the things of earth their goal will not. Let's look at Revelation 18, verses 15 through 17. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of a torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. Whew. I'm going you know, to read that again. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. The great men of the earth, like the kings of the earth, will sorrow after Babylon with the sorrow of the world. 2 Corinthians 7.10. There's a difference between the star of the world. Not for their sins will they weep and wail, but for the loss of what they revered in Babylon, its riches. When you look at the, the people of the sea in verse 17, they li like, they're listed here. They were the common people 
that were enriched by Babylon, you know, versus the great men. They toiled for Babylon's wealth. The word for trade here actually refers to the word toil. They are described as shipmasters, company in ships, sailors, and traders by sea because they could only gain Babylon's riches by working together. Like the kings and merchants, the people of the sea fled to the mountains to view Babylon's destruction and lament what they lost. Let's look at verse 18. Revelation 18, 18 reads, And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? The phrase the people, like the people of the sea use here is a phrase that's used in praising and worshiping God. You can look at this for yourself. Exodus 15, 11, Psalms 35, verse 10, and Jeremiah 10, verse 7. The common people of the world revered Babylon as God. You can look at that for yourself. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And they're going to Revelation 13, verse 4. And they're going to do so even as, as Babylon's being destroyed in front of their eyes. Even as Babylon is being destroyed in front of their eyes, they still revere Babylon as God. The influence of Babylon will be very powerful upon the wicked when that time gets here. Revelation 18, 19 reads, And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she made desolate. In addition to their weeping and wailing like the merchants, did, the people of the sea will also cast dust on their head, an additional sign of mourning. Why? They had more invested in Babylon. Not only did they revere it as God, but meeting the needs of ba Babylon's costly lifestyle made many of these people rich. These guys were like, they had to toil together. Work, like uh, giving Babylon, like uh, providing for its needs made them rich. Revelation 18, verse 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Why does heaven make this proclamation? Why these parties, heaven, the holy apostles, and the prophets? Why these three? You ever think about that? The inhabitants of heaven were wronged by Babylon. She blasphemed them with her lies about them, Revelation 13, verse 6, and caused them great grief by leading many of the heirs of salvation they were ministering to astray beyond recovery, Matthew 18, verse 10, and Luke 15, verse 7. And they also used them to keep others from heaven, Matthew 20 through 13. But it wasn't just the angels who were wronged by Babylon's blasphemy. It was all the inhabitants of heaven. Who else lives in heaven? God. God himself was wronged. Blasphemy against God, particularly the Holy Spirit, is the unpardonable sin from which there is no forgiveness. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Every attempt to reform Babylon was met with violent opposition. It refused to hearken to the warnings God sent through, it to, like, through his people. Heaven was abused by Babylon, and in judging it, God acknowledged the wrong done to all heaven by this kingdom. The holy apostles and prophets continued the work of the gospel after Jesus' ascension. They were the ones God used to expand the church, build it, and to guide it. Each of them in their respective office, were ambassadors of heaven, representatives of the Lord. Doing harm to them was akin to attacking God himself. And Babylon did this repeatedly. The prophets were killed and all the apostles, save one, died violent deaths. In judging Babylon, God avenged them. You can look up for yourself, Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. Revelation 18, verse 21, let's go there. Revelation 18, 21. Are we all there? Oh, you, like, when I found this one, this was, this was amazing. So get ready for this one. I was surprised. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, 
Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Oh, Lord, him be able to speak us in truth. It was preferable to Jesus for someone to hang a millstone on their neck and jump into the sea than then offend children and the young in faith. Matthew 18, verse 6, Luke 17, verse 2. The fact that it was so dramatically displayed here is telling us that Babylon, the pagan faiths of the world and spiritualism, the Roman Catholic Church, and the apostate Protestant churches played a great role in offending children and the young in faith. Did you catch that? The offenses committed are of such significance that Jesus revealed it to John and it is faithfully recorded. It is not passed over, but forever written in the annals of Bible prophecy. What was done to God's children and the young in faith will never be forgotten. It's on the records that three three parties offended the children and the young in faith. The mighty angel's proclamation here is telling us that God will throw down Babylon. We see a similar moment in the vision of Daniel 2. A stone cut without hands will break all the kingdoms of the world into pieces and consume them. Nothing of Babylon will be found when the Lord carries out this work, his work. This is his work. I'm going to say it again. This is his work. It is not man's work to usher in the kingdom beyond his appointed task to fulfill the Great Commission. Revelation 18, verse 22. Let's go there. And it reads, and the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpers shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of millstones shall be heard no more at all in thee. The voices of these musicians are the voices of the redeemed. The 144,000 and the numberless multitude who will be saved from Babylon. See this for yourself. Revelation 14 verse 2. And Matthew 11, verses 16 through 19. The craftsmen were the people who facilitated the false worship of Babylon. Like Demetrius and the silversmiths before them, you can look at that for yourself in Acts 19, verses 23 through 41. They work to counter the faithful Christians spreading the gospel. When Babylon is destroyed, the people who spread these false teachings of this fallen church will also be destroyed. The references to a millstone point to the judgment that will be carried out, carried out against those who offend young children and the young in faith in Babylon. So you see, it said twice, this is going to happen to those who offend the children and the young in faith. Revelation 18, verse 23 reads, let's read it together. And the light of a candle, let's read this one all together. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for the merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Did you catch that? The Lord brought that one to me just now. Remember how we talked about, like in the very beginning, in Revelation 18, verse 4, the, uh, the people were called to come out of Babylon? Watch how this works in here. Jesus taught us that we are to be lights in the world. That through the good works we do, people will glorify God in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. That will no longer be seen in Babylon in the time of trouble. That light will go out when God calls his people out of Babylon. Revelation 18, verse 4. When that happens, Babylon will no longer have a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. Psalm 119, 105. The famine for the word of God will be very real. Amos 11, 8, 11. We already talked about that. Anyone who is still in Babylon will no longer be a light that shines in a dark place. If you try to stay and think you can witness people and try to get them out still, got news for you. There will be no light in Babylon when God, like, uh, when God calls them to come out. There will be no more light in there. You will not be a light. You will be part of the darkness. 
Do not stay when God tells you to leave. Jesus called out to Babylon from within through his people. Many heeded the midnight cry in Babylon to meet the bridegroom, and they came out of it. But many others stayed behind. Like the foolish virgins in Jesus' parable, the fallen Christians had no oil in their lamps. Matthew 25, verses 1 through 8. They could not hear the call of the Spirit and the bride to come because they resisted it for so long. Revelation 22, verse 17. Receiving and walking in the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. And Galatians 5, 16. Using his gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11. To fulfill the great commission and grow in Christ. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. If they had done these things, it would have fulfilled the lamps of these believe, uh, filled the lamps of these believers. Doing these things would have opened the scriptures to them and enabled them to hear the call of the bridegroom and bride with joy. Look at this for yourself. 2 Peter 1, 20 and, 20, uh, 20 and 21. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. John 16, 13 to 15. And John 3, 29. When the redeemed flee Babylon... The voice calling them for them to for these Christians to do these things will be gone. They won't hear the voice anymore. Before John the Baptist was born, hearing the mother of Jesus' voice caused him to leap for joy. Luke 1, 40 through 49. After John was born, near the end of his ministry, he testified that hearing the voice of the bridegroom, Jesus, brought him joy. John 3, 29. John was a friend of the bridegroom as are all who do as Jesus says, John 14, 15, John 15, 14. Babylon did not listen to Jesus' voice. It persecuted his church and blasphemed his name, his mission, and his character. In so doing, they spurned the friendship of Jesus for the wine, the false teachings of Babylon. We talked about false teachings a lot this morning. The great men of the earth became Babylon's merchants. They sold goods that mixed truth with error. They were well paid by Babylon. In hearkening to and selling these false teachings, they caused many to not heed the voice of the bridegroom and the bride. We put a lot of trust in famous people. We put a lot of trust in famous people. They are selling you truth mixed with error. Many of them are selling truth mixed with error. I warn you now, if you put your trust in famous people, because you're going to do something because famous people told you to do it, you are putting yourself on this path. Do not drink what they offer you. Do not take in what they offer you. Put your trust in the one who deserves your praise, your adulation, your worship, your trust, the Lord. Put your trust in him. He is giving you all this information in advance. All this is given to you in advance. For nearly 2,000 years, this has been given to you in advance. He is telling you what will happen before it happens. I can't make it any plainer. Who am I going to trust more? A famous celebrity or someone who was high in society or the Lord? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The great men of the earth became Babylon's merchants. They became its merchants. But what were the sorceries that Babylon used to deceive the nations? This was actually an interesting one. The Strong's Concordance defines sorcery as magic. Magic is defined by Oxford languages as the power of apparently influencing the course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. The power, signs, and lying wonders of the man of sin, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, were used to deceive the world into worshiping him as God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. They influenced the course of events that led the world to wonder after the beast. Revelation 13, verse 3. Let's go to Revelation 18, verse 24 now, final verse. 
And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. The blood of all who were ever killed lay at Babylon's doorstep. How is that possible? Satan is the head of Babylon. And it was by his design that Abel was killed. Every prophet, every believer, every unbeliever that ever died is on his hands. It has been asserted that Satan never killed anyone. It has been asserted that Satan never killed anyone. But Jesus Christ tells us that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. John 8, 44. His revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, tells us that Satan is responsible for all who were violently murdered. That's the Greek, Thayer's Greek lexicon for the word slain. All who were violently murdered, that's on him. Now, let's wrap this up. In Revelation 18, we saw three main points, three main topics here. Number one, in its rebellion against God, Babylon has reached the point of no return, and God will call his people out of it before he pours out the seven last plagues upon it. That's one. Number two, when the seven last plagues are poured out, Babylon will be destroyed. When it is the kings of the earth the merchants of the earth and the people of the sea will lament its destruction, not their choice to serve it and not God. The people will not have changed, and at this point, they never will. Point number three, Babylon will be destroyed for the evil it carried out against heaven and against God's people on the earth. It is his judgment. Ancient Israel faced similar judgments in its history when it departed from the Lord. They pointed to this judgment. They also pointed to the time before these judgments took place. What happened before these judgments took place? Do you guys remember that? What happened? It was in that time that God's prophets fervently warned Israel to turn from its sinful ways or it will be judged. That This message was rejected by many and embraced by few. The world today is being fervently warned. And when the Holy Spirit calls upon them and fills them with his power, the prophets will call his people to return to him. Many will be called and few will be chosen. Matthew 22, 14. Few will come out of spiritual Babylon as they came out of the nation of ancient Israel. The prophecies of Revelation are not fully welcomed by the church. They're not but they must be given. The world must be warned. Come out of Babylon. Come out of the fallen church, out of the confusing doctrines. Don't wait until this time to come to flee the failing church state system. Don't wait until then. Come out now, out of Babylon and into a church that is patient under persecution and keeps the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, verse 12. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for this. All I can do is marvel. God is merciful. You have it written down Verse by verse, we go through them. You're told what's going to happen in advance. Many will respond with their intellectual debating arguments. Well, that's not going to happen. Well, this is not going to happen. But look at God's track record. When has he been wrong? Look at the track record. If you want to do your research, try to research every time God has been wrong. And you tell me what you find out. Tell me what you find out. And if God has not been wrong, if God has not been wrong, and he's telling us what's happening, going to happen in advance, why are you questioning it now when you have a full track record? You might question his character. What kind of God does this or that? 
Here's a question for you. How well do you know God? How well have you researched and read what the Bible has taught? Not to sit up here and try to force your arguments back on God, but to actually listen. How well do you know it? How well have you known him? Not just what's in his book. How well have you known him? Because there are a lot of people, there's hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of people who will tell you otherwise. He has a character that has proven his love for you multiple times over and over again. He has sent you his son to die for sins that he did not commit. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't go through this. None of these things that happen at Babylon has to happen to you. All you have to do is get on the ark. You see the ark right in front of you. The door is open. Noah, the Noah of our time, is telling you to go in. And instead of going in before the rains fall, you want to have a, you want to have a shouting match. You want to have intellectual debates. Some of us want to cling to our sins. They can't give them up. They feel so good. We talked about that this morning. Just because something feels good does not mean that it is good. People take pleasure in all sorts of things. In this case, we talked about sensual pleasure this morning. But people also take pleasure in killing people, hurting people, gossiping about people, slandering them. We take pleasure in watching these things when we, when we do our entertainment. We talked about entertainment this morning. People take pleasure in watching these things. But does that mean it is good? No, it is not. It goes against everything that even the unbelievers say they want in the world, peace between everyone. But we still entertain things that educate us to love violence, to love horrific things, sex, among other things. We are being falsely educated, but yet we have desires for that which we cannot fulfill. Something is wrong with what your, the world's ideas are in its walk. What they talk and what they walk are two different things. And what they talk and what they walk, they are not walking in the spirit. You have seen the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. That is the fruit of walking in the flesh. That is the result. No matter how many high standing ideas they may have, they are not going to do what God can do. No amount of legislation, no amount of laws that control behavior will ever get you the result that God will give. You cannot save this world. You cannot save it. The creator is telling you that you can't save it. When the, the person who built the house, he tells you that the house is beyond repair. You are clinging to the house, even though it's falling down all around you. He's telling you to get out, but you don't want to leave the house. Well, what's going to happen? The house is going to fall with you in it. The house couldn't be saved, and when at the end of it, you choose to stay in it, neither will you. That, that's a warning for Christians. When you see the house is falling apart, get out of the house. Come out of Babylon when he tells you. Come out of Babylon. Don't try to save the house. God is going to give us a new house, a better house, one that doesn't have all the ills of the world in it. Trust the God who's going to build you a new house. Everything that you think that you can do on your own apart from God, God is going to do. He is going to deliver. I'm really hoping that at the end of all this, people will not try to censor messages like these because... You see what Jesus has given you. This is a relation of Jesus Christ. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not be ashamed of the revelation of Jesus Christ. They are all one. You cannot just have Jesus who just heals the sick 
and feeds the hungry and clothes the naked, will I have in God who will judge the world? He's going to judge the world. Judgment was committed to him. John 5, 22. It was committed to him. He's going to destroy this world and make it anew. He's going to save everyone who puts their trust in him. This is that same Jesus. We cannot divorce the two. You know, people try to have angry God and peaceful God, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, and then some, but they're doing the same thing to Jesus. I want the Jesus of the gospel who heals and helps people. I don't want the, the Jesus who judges people. You're doing the same thing. Jesus is trying to save you. He did not come to us to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. John 3, 17. He's trying to save you. And if you saw the Jesus of the gospels trying to save you, why would you not trust him as he reveals his revelation to you? Why does that, why does that make you distrust him? Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Put your trust, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Not in these famous people. Not in these celebrities. Not in these men, men of high rank influence office. You are putting your faith in humanity. Put your faith in divinity. In the Lord. I pray that this message will encourage you to turn to the Lord if you haven't done so before you heard this message. If you were on the fence before, I hope you won't be now. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not even promised the rest of your day today. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to get on your knees and pray before the Lord now. Ask him to forgive you of your sins to get you ready for his return, to get you ready that when the time comes, that when he says come out of Babylon, wherever you are, that you will come out. That when it's time for you to flee and go where God has told you to go, Matthew 24, uh, Matthew 24 he talks about this. When it's time for you to flee, get out. Don't wait. Follow the Lord. Let's pray, everyone. Dear Lord, we come before you, Lord, in gratitude that such a message like this was given to us in advance. Lord, if we're not careful, we could be deceived. The elect could be deceived. But your revelation, Lord, all of it was designed to prepare us, Lord, for that day. And we ask you through your graces, O Lord, that for those souls who are in Babylon now, whether they be in the pagan phase of the world, whether it be in the Roman Catholic Church or the Protestant churches, we pray, O oh God, that by your graces, O oh Lord, that you will shine the light upon them, the light to their feet and the lamp, like the lamp to their feet and the light to their path. We ask for the shine to them, they will follow it, and that by your graces, O oh Lord, we will be ready to meet you when you return. We ask these things, O oh Lord, and for your spirits work on our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>